And so Jung generated up a category to account for that which he felt was expressed in all sorts of symbolic ways So for example, the wise old man, like, like the wizards in, in the movies that all of you have seen in the last five years It's always the same wizard, sometimes it's even the same actor It's like, that's an archetype of the wise old man And for Jung, Christ was an archetype of the self as well And I, I told you why that was to some degree, and it's partly because the phoenix is also an archetype of the self, because the phoenix is something that can die and be reborn And so the phoenix stands for the part of your personality that can let one thing go One part of you, which is an alive part, can let that go and burn up, so to speak, so that something new can be born Because you very seldom gain something before you let something else go That's partly because what you already assume can be the worst impediment that you have to, to, to learning something new And it's complicated because sometimes what you know worked in the past You know, so you can think about that Maybe you're a perfectly well adapted 11 year old and you're still acting that way when you're 15 It's like, well, it's hard to let that go because it worked and you put a lot of effort into it But unless you let it go, the new personality isn't going to be able to manifest itself So you have to stop being a child before you can be an adult, and there's a sacrifice that goes along with that It's also a sacrifice that parents have to make, right? Because in order for a parent to encourage you to adopt the responsibilities of an individual They have to allow you as a child to die And Freud's observation on that phenomena was that many parents And he believed this was particularly characteristic of mothers because of their tight Bond with their children and the dependency that that implies That it was particularly difficult for a mother to let her child die so that an adult could manifest itself in that child's place And that's fundamentally, in many ways, the Oedipal complex You know, as you go through life, there's going to be triumphs and then catastrophes And when there's a catastrophe, the psyche falls apart and then Maybe it gathers its resources back together and pulls itself together It's going like this Well, Jung would say the self is what's guiding that process So the ego feels it like this So that's triumph and catastrophe and triumph and catastrophe or tragedy and comedy But the self is the thing that's underneath all of it Allowing those transformations to take place And that's Rafiki and that's why he's associated as well with the sun When, when a king-like organization grows up which means any organization, anything that's a hierarchy and that's powerful There's a shadow element to it that tends towards totalitarianism and tyranny And that's represented often by the king's evil brother It's a very common motif in, in mythologically based stories And the king is generally blind to his brother So often willfully blind, although that doesn't really seem to be the case in The Lion King it's, It is clearly the case that Mufasa underestimates the danger posed by his usually older and smarter brother it's, and, and the myths very often make the case that the evil king is the older one and also the one that's more intelligent And the reason for that is that, as far as I can tell, is that intelligence is something that can go very wrong if it goes wrong And one of its big temptations is that it produces models of the world and then falls in love with the models And when it falls in love with the models, that makes it totalitarian Because it believes that its constructions are good enough so that there doesn't need to be anything else So it eliminates the necessity of the transcendent And that's definitely a characteristic of any totalitarian system It says, this is everything we need And then, you know, if you happen to suffer, or if you happen to openly rebel against the system, then you're regarded as an enemy of truth, and then it's fine to do with you whatever might be done Because everything worth doing has already been done the, the kingdom is a bounded place And so, that's playing off the idea of explored territory versus unexplored territory Or the known versus the unknown And the proposition there is that whatever the dominance hierarchy happens to be It has a limited domain of A limited domain of competence 
And the domain of competence is defined by everything that the light touches Now, this is actually something that you can notice in your own life It's, it's quite interesting You'll see that if you move into a new place or a new neighborhood Or if you do anything new at all That nothing that you haven't attended to is actually yours It will, it will stay foreign in a sense and unfamiliar to you Until you interact with it with a substantial amount of attention And that's partly because while you're attending to it Which is an act of conscious will You're, you're, you're modifying your perceptions and your thoughts and your actions and your emotions To take it into account as a phenomena And that means that you're competent there And it takes conscious effort to be competent Because you have to practice being competent at a new domain And until you've practiced being competent in a new domain It's not yours And so this clip is showing what's basically an eternal truth Which is that your territory is whatever you've mastered and it's demarcated by everything you haven't mastered And in this particular representation, that's associated with, with death It's also associated in some bizarre sense with paradise Because, of course, Simba encounters the elephant's grave out in no man's land, so to speak But when he runs away across the desert, he also finds paradise And so there's a paradoxical idea there that the unknown contains death and everything you need to make your life Worthwhile How many of you have seen Groundhog Day? Yeah, yeah, you remember in Groundhog Day Bill Murray's character is a real, he's a jackass at the beginning He's very arrogant and he's very unskilled And then he gets stuck in the same day Which is pretty funny because that is what happens to you if you're arrogant and unskilled You end up in the same damn day That's not fun And then in that day he becomes attracted to this woman who's an anima figure and. For, for years, as far as the film's concerned, every time he approaches her in his arrogant and clumsy way, she slaps him So there's one scene in the movie where, I think it lasts for about 30 seconds, and it's nothing but clips of her slapping him Probably 30 times, at that point you've seen him go through the same day in the continually painful way that he does And she slaps him in those longer clips, and after a while the filmmaker gets tired of that and just shows you nothing but the slaps You know, eventually He's brought so far down as a consequence of being stuck in the same day and continually being slapped That he falls completely apart, right? Then he tries to kill himself And one of the very comical things about that movie is that that doesn't work either He just wakes up in the same day again And you know, what that means in some sense is that if you're too damn stubborn to change You will keep running into the same thing over and over Continually, and that's why you're in the same day Because you won't let go of it and that might drive you even to question the value of your own being But that's also not a very useful adaptive strategy You know, and it isn't until he starts to take his rejection seriously That he starts to actually build some real character, right? And then he starts paying attention to the day And finds out that there's all sorts of things that he can do during that day To make it rich and meaningful And as soon as he does that enough and becomes an expert at it Poof! He gets out of the, the day The same Horrible day And so that horrible day is also a representation of Of the tyranny of the state Because the state is something that's static So anyways Nella, she's...